Okay, it's five o'clock. And if you look to your screen, I'm going to put up the request for Dharma. Okay, so I'm going to invite everyone in joining me in putting um, your palms together. Uh, so a request for, for Dharma is pretty important. Uh, it comes from your heart. And your sincerity will actually, uh, if, if you are in a Buddha hall, apparently if the people who are doing the request is really sincere, the, uh, it is said that the beings from the Eightfold Pantheon, the gods, the Buddhas, the Bodhisattvas, uh, the Dharma spirit protectors, they all come to, to listen. So, um, where it doesn't matter where you are, we all know uh, what Bodhidharma has said, your body is the Sangharama. Your body where you practice is the monastery. Don't think that the monastery is a physical place that's somewhere else. So your sincerity, um, not only does it have a psych psychological impact on how you hear the and process the teachings, but uh, you are also inviting uh, really, really good, wholesome beings uh, to come and, and protect you. All right, so I'm going to begin with my palms together. Gong Ching Ta Te San Ting Wei Shu Fa Hui Ji Yi Che Chong Shen Jing Chuan Miao Fa Lun Jiao Ta Woman Ru He Liao Sheng To Se Li Ku Te Le Su Cheng Wu Sheng Now we do it in English. Will the Sangha with great virtue out of compassion for the sake of this assembly and all living beings please turn the wonderful dharma will to teach us how to live suffering and attain bliss and end birth and death and quickly realize non-birth Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambhutasa Homage to the Blessed, Noble and Perfectly Enlightened One Namo Sadanto Suchetoye Allahati Sanmyao Sanputoche Wu Shang Shen Shen Wei Miao Fa Bai Chen Wan Jie Nan Sao Yi Wo Jin Jian Wen De Shou Chu Yan Jie Ru Lai Zhen Shu Yi Supreme and wondrous Dharma, subtle and profound, rarely is encountered even in a billion eons. But now we see and hear it and accept it reverently. May we truly understand the Buddha's actual meaning. Okay, and now we're going to recite Medicine Master Buddha's name seven times. Namo quelling disasters, lengthening life, Medicine Master Buddha. 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 Namo quelling disasters, lengthening life. Medicine Master Buddha. Now more quelling disasters, lengthening life, Medicine Master Buddha. Hello everyone, welcome to class number, I believe it's class number 10. Yes, wow, this is, uh, time has passed really quickly. So today I'm really excited because um, I have a lot, there's a lot to, to cover uh, and why I'm excited is because this, uh, this part that we're going to talk about today was one of the turning points in my, uh, you could say, my journey as a monk. Um, yeah, uh, I'll, I'll let the, the, the words uh, do the talking instead of me. But first, 
Um, there's a question that I have neglected from the past few classes. Uh, the question was, what are the six recollections? So that's the proper name. I found it. It's called the six recollections. And what are they? If you look at your screen, it's the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha, and then the fourth one is precepts. Sometimes uh, they call it virtue or morality, basically character. Okay, who you are as a person, how you relate to people. Number five is generosity. And number six is the gods. So these are the six recollections. Why do we have the six recollections? Well, in the Theravada text, I'm going to scroll down a bit. Okay. In the, oh, sorry about that. Okay. In the, in the Theravada text, there's something called the Visuddhi Maga, and it actually has 10, which is an addition, there's an additional four to the six that we just talked about. Why is that important? Because it leads to concentration. Okay. And the first one, we all know what it is. Uh, if it's not obvious yet, the first one is actually the same as before the Buddha. And this later, it, was, it is said that this later uh, became um, or evolved or is recognized as the Pure Land School, mindfulness of the Buddha. So what is the additional four? Okay. You have mindfulness of death. Uh, really, really important. The Buddha calls it a burning house. Uh, mindfulness of the body. Number nine, mindfulness of your breathing, the in and out breath. And number 10 is peace or tranquility. Peace and tranquility is having a, um, like a, a understanding what it means for the mind to be really quiet and peaceful and using that as an anchor point uh, throughout the day when you go back to. Okay. I have an interesting anecdote. I'm going to scroll up a bit. Okay. I'm going to highlight this. Okay. The first paragraph says, out of all these 10 recollections, re mindfulness of the in breath and out breath can produce all four dhyanas, while recollection of the body can produce the first. Okay. In and out breathing seems, sounds like a really simple dharma dog. But just concentrating on your breathing can take you to the fourth dhyana, apparently. Uh, and the rest, uh, if you look at the second paragraph, um, can produce only excess concentration. I, if I'm not mistaken, that's the first first dhyana. I have to check that out. Uh, but it's that's important because just being mindful of the Buddha's name does lead to proper concentration. Okay, and then if you look at the bottom of the screen, uh, I have a note that this comes from the end of last week's class, Show Bodhidharma's explanation of the various forms or practices. I'll come to that. Uh, but first, I wanted to share with you, uh, since we've started on the sutra, what does what is a sutra? Okay, so Shufu says a sutra is, and this is from the commentary, I'm going to put it on screen and this is going to shape today's uh, discussion oh, all right there you go what is a sutra Shufa says has four meanings number one is stringing together um, what do you string together the principles and the meanings spoken by the buddha so there's an order in how the buddha speaks uh, that has a beginning and then there's a middle and then it goes towards the end and then number two, it attracts living beings. It gathers in living beings. Just like like right now in spirit, we are all in the same place. Our minds are all focused on one sutra, although we are all around the world. Okay. And number three, being constant. I guess this is about the principle uh, or the teachings. It doesn't change from ancient times to the past, whether the sutras are spoken by the Buddhas of the past, present or future, they're always the same. And if you have uh, uh, investigated the Avatamsaka Sutra, the Flower Adornment Sutra, it's really interesting because the Buddha, uh, or I'm not sure if the Buddha spoke that section, but there's a section where uh, someone speaks about the Four Noble Truths and how the Four Noble Truths are known in different worlds. The, and it's really interesting because the principles are the same, uh, but how, the, the specifics are slightly different. Yeah. 
and it's because in different worlds um, they, they talk about how beings communicate differently some communicate through um, sound like us we are called sound hearers some communicate through uh, gestures some communicate through smell uh, I have no idea my mind can't process that but uh, yes so uh, the four noble truths in principle is the same no matter where you go I guess that's because the three poisons greed anger and ignorance is always the same but in how it's explained is uh, different in different worlds okay and number four I'm going to scroll this up so it's easier a sutra is called a standard and it's followed by all Buddhas and all living beings of the past, present, and future. And I, uh, this is, I think, fairly similar to number three. Uh, it's the way you achieve uh, Buddhahood. So, Shufu also says that uh, he gives other uh, analog analogies or metaphors for what a sutra is. And one of which is a chalk line. Does anyone know what a chalk line is? A chalk line is used uh, when you want to make a when you want to um, mark a straight line. It's a string that you can buy at a hardware shop like Home Depot. Uh, it's a string that's in a container that has uh, usually blue colored or maybe pink colored uh, powder. So what you do is you stretch the string out in the straight line, and then you pull the string up and you let it go and. It hits the surface and it leaves that that line for you and why do you want a straight line okay i'm going to show you a photo this is the sidewalk right outside berkeley buddhist monastery uh if you are standing where my mouse is on the left looking at the right side of the photo that's where the, the main entrance is so this is a sidewalk outside Berkeley Monastery. We just had a new uh, sidewalk put in with the brick lane done by our community, uh, Kong, uh, Mr. Win, and a, few, uh, a lot, a lot of people contributed. And they use a chalk line to mark out uh, this uh, retaining wall, I guess, uh, to make sure it's straight. Let me see if I have another angle. Yes, this is another angle. And you can see the straightness um, of the of what they did. Yeah, it's not easy. But this is, uh, I guess, easily maybe twenty feet. Yeah, and to make it straight like that uh, takes a lot of skill and uh, know-how. Yeah. So chalk line uh, to build a wall like this. Uh, my question for everyone is: How about all of you who are listening right now? What are you building? What is your intention in listening to the sutra? Okay. All right. You don't have to answer me. It, it's, I, I think it's a very personal uh, question. Uh, it has to do with your intentions, your vows, and basically what you get out of the sutra. All right. So you can you can keep that thought with you as we progress through the sutra. What are you building with this sutra? Okay. So so now we come to. Uh, can you just give me a second. I just got. Uh... Okay. All right. Uh, so having gone through that, we'll go through what Bodhidharma has to say right now. And this has to do with here. Yeah, um, this is the sutra text. Just let me find the spot. Okay. Let me increase the size. And wait for screen. Okay. Manjushri Bodhisattva, if you remember from the last class, he requested this sutra for beings in the Dharma image age. And if you remember, um, I shared what my thoughts were about. Uh, we are in the Dharma ending age right now. When the Buddha was around, it was a proper Dharma age. And then um, depending on who you uh, listen to, 
the first 500 years of the Buddha's time was known as a proper Dharma age. And then the second 500 or 1000 years after that was the Dharma image age. And then right now where we are after that is known as the Dharma any age. Oh, okay. And to me, the significance is that in the Dharma ending age, we are so far removed, uh, both in time, culture, symbols from the Buddha's time, that we have really, um, it's, it's hard to, to decode the, the metaphors and the similes and, and the stories the Buddha left us uh, and to understand the practice itself. So what do I mean by this? Well, so we have, I'm going to channel Bodhidharma. Okay. Okay, let me paste the text. Okay. This is what Bodhidharma has to say. Oh. All right. It says the sutras of the Buddha contain countless metaphors. Because mortals have shallow minds and don't understand anything deep, the Buddha used the tangible to represent the sublime. People who seek blessings by concentrating on external works instead of internal cultivation are attempting the impossible. My guess is that Bodhidharma um, was speaking to monks when he when when he said this. Mm -hmm. uh, so the rest of it is very uh, uh, straightforward. It's. Uh, uh, it's like very uh, no nonsense. Okay, what does Bodhidharma talk about? Okay, let me copy, paste. Okay, he he talks about the monastery, and we've talked about this before. Bodhidharma sees the monastery as our bodies, with our senses as the gates. Okay, senses as gates. What are our senses? Our eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body. And our mind. So we have six gates. And Bodhidharma says, whoever denies entry to the three poisons and keeps the gates of his senses pure, his body and mind still, inside and outside clean, builds a monastery. So we've gone through this before and uh, I don't have to elaborate for today. And then the second thing that Bodhidharma says is fasting. We have also talked about this. Bodhinama takes the understanding of practice uh, of fasting. Um, not it's not just an external thing that you do that has to do with food, but he contextualizes it in terms of actual practice that leads to transformation. So what did he say? He says to fast means to regulate regulate your body and mind so they're not distracted or disturbed. Okay, I'm going to highlight this fasting means guarding against the six attractions on the outside remember the six senses okay the six gates this is the same thing the six attractions on the outside and the three poisons on the inside and striving through contemplate through contem excuse me <laughs> through contemplation to purify your body and mind so he calls it food of delusion that's what he means when he says fast. Okay. He says, he's like scolding people. He says, uh, let me scroll down. Okay. He says the world is full of deluded people who don't see this. They indulge in the body and mind in all manner of evil. They give free reign to their passions and have no shame. And when they stop eating ordinary food, they call it fasting. How absurd. And that was me. I used to hold the eight precepts that way. Uh, just thinking by not eating after lunch that uh, I was doing um, the actual practice and I did not understand because I have not I did not read Bodhidharma at that time okay this is what he has to say about casting statues recently uh, just a few years back at I believe Avatamsaka Monastery in Canada uh, they had a amazing project where you know the 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 Buddha images that Shufu made for the Buddha Hall at the city of ten thousand Buddhas, uh, they had that too. They you could, if you were there, you could cast your own statue and you could write out a sutra. I wasn't part of that exercise, um, so I'm not sure what sutra people wrote out. 
and then you you would put your uh, copy of the sutra that you had traced out with your hands in the, the image of the Buddha. Yeah, um, it was a really wonderful uh, project. So this is what Bodhidharma has to say about casting statues. He says, casting statues refers to all practices cultivated by those who seek enlightenment. By acting in accordance with the Buddha's teachings, you create a perfect likeness. So Bodhidharma, Bodhidharma is talking about when he's when he says the sutra says casting statues, there's an external practice that you can do, which is actually carving, or in this case uh, of Avatamsaka Monastery, they you they casted a plaster uh, statue, or you could do one in different grades of metal, bronze, uh, copper. Uh, all the way up to gold, you know, um, they have different levels, uh, carving with wood, uh, concrete, for example, okay, Bodhidharma brings it back to the inside. I say, he says, you use your body as the furnace, all right, and then what's the fire? A furnace needs fire, the fire is Dharma, and then your skill how nice your Buddha image comes out is wisdom. How much you understand. The more you understand, then the closer you are to, to being actually like a Buddha. And then he talks about the three sets of precepts. I'll come to that. That's in the explanation is in the parenthesis. The three sets of precepts and the six parameters as the mole. That's what shapes you. Okay, so what are the three sets of precepts? Three sets of precepts is you vow to stop all unwholesome deeds, that means not, not doing any evil. You want to develop and maintain all good deeds or beneficial deeds, and you want to save all living beings. All right, and the six parameters are giving. Let me highlight that and scroll up a bit. Giving, precepts, patience, vigor, concentration and wisdom. So what Bodhidharma is, is doing here is, for example, if we link this back to the three um, uh, Dharma ages, so in the proper Dharma age, when the Buddha spoke about casting statues, people immediately knew, okay, what it meant. It means you mold yourself after the Buddha. Okay. And I'm just using a very simple explanation that I can I can understand. So I'm just sharing, sharing it with you. And then in the Dharma uh, image age, uh, people started seeing this, taking this as a practice. They started actually casting and making a lot of images as a, as a practice. But at the same time, they also knew that by doing this to maybe as a Dharma door to, to calm their minds down, because there is a sutra that actually talks about uh, casting Buddha images and uh, uh, they have rules like the proportions of the length of the, the arms and, and the body, the torso. Uh, you, you can do it as a way to become really, really concentrated and to develop your devotion. Uh, so my guess is that during the, the Dharma image age, people as they did external practices like this, they also knew how to develop internally. And then now in the Dharma ending age, uh, I guess people still have the, the form of the practice. You still uh, mold it. I'm not sure how many people listening uh, actually participated in that um, that that project with our Time Mon Monastery. If you did, maybe you can share your thoughts in the chat box. But how many who did actually had the understanding that, oh, as I am casting an external image of the Buddha, I'm supposed to be molding my behavior after the Buddha as well. So that's the fun that's how I see the Dharma and the age. We've lost touch with the spirit of the practice. Like we talk about how I used to hold the eight precepts, right? Okay, so that's for casting statues. And then the next thing we have is uh, Bodhidharma talking about incense. Okay.
what is incense in Bodhidharma's perspective? Okay, he says burning incense doesn't mean ordinary material incense, but the incense of the intangible Dharma. Okay, intangible, unseen. You, 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 you can't uh, see it. Which drives away filth, ignorance, and evil deeds with its perfume. It says there are five kinds of incense. These five are the most precious kinds of incense and far superior to anything the world has to offer. When the Buddha was in the world, he told his, he told his disciples to light such precious incense with a fire of awareness. Ah, this is another uh, new thing. With a fire of awareness as an offering to the Buddhas of the Ten Directions. What does that mean? To light such precious incense with a fire of awareness, it means practice. It's through your practice that you offer, it is your practice, your conduct that you're offering to the Buddhas of the Ten Directions. Okay, let, let me highlight the next sentence and I'm going to scroll down. Okay. But people today don't understand the Tathagata's real meaning. They use an ordinary flame to light material incense of sandalwood or frankincense and pray for some future blessing that never comes. Are people familiar with frankincense? Uh, most people know sandalwood. We have frankincense. Uh, it's a resin from a tree in Berkeley Buddhist Monastery. And uh, you don't light it directly. You put it either on a charcoal disc that you uh, you light, uh, the charcoal doesn't burn, but the charcoal, charcoal burns, but without a flame and it, it becomes really hot. And then you put the resin on top of it. It looks like a, like a pebble, yellowish, uh, depending on the, I guess the grade of frankincense. And as an Asian, never, not, not going to, a, uh, I don't really go to a, ch to churches. I've never really s smelled frankincense before. It's really nice. It's like a, to me, it's like a citrusy, lemony kind of smell. This is one of my favorite smells. So Bodhidharma says there are five kinds of incense. I'm going to scroll down a bit. And what are they? Okay. Says the first is the incense of morality, meaning character, precepts, which means renouncing evil and cultivating virtue. Second is the incense of meditation, which means deeply believing in the Mahayana or the Buddha's teachings with unwavering resolve. So Mahayana uh, meaning, um, for those of you who are new to that word, if you look at the world right now, there exists uh, two main forms of Buddhism, Theravada, which you find in predominantly in Thailand, Sri Lanka, uh, Thailand, Sri Lanka, I know I'm missing one country, um, uh, Myanmar, and then uh, Mahayana is uh, found in China, Korea, Taiwan, for example. Uh, the Theravada is more geared towards uh, ending your own suffering. And then Mahayana teachings is more about not just ending your own suffering, but uh, going all the way to Buddhahood and uh, during your journey in saving all living beings. Okay. Number three. The third incense that Bodhidharma um, uh, explains is the incense of wisdom. And this comes from contemplating the body and mind inside and out. Okay, that means you uh, do it thoroughly. Fourth is the incense of liberation, which means you cut off the bonds of ignorance. You are no longer, there's no longer something that you don't understand, especially about yourself or how your mind works. Faith is the incense of perfect knowledge, which means being always aware and nowhere obstructed. So to me, this certainly, um, how you say, uh, I guess when you offer incense, if you have an altar at home, what goes through your mind as you're offering the incense? So that's what Bodhidharma is saying, the incense doesn't Yes, there is the physical incense that the sutra speaks about, but there's also another deeper side that incense means your character through precepts. So as you're offering incense, what actually you're offering is this five incense or a simpler way of putting it is your conduct as a result of holding the precepts well. So conduct 
it's also a clue to how to hold the precepts. Are you holding precepts uh, on behalf of the people that you care for? Or are you holding precepts just only for your own, um, say, blessings or, or liberation? Okay, so uh, there's something to, to think about. And also in, in Buddhism, um, when you go to, especially in Chinese uh, Buddhist temples, uh, like CDTB and our branches, when you go up to the Buddha, you don't actually offer any incense. You put your palms together and you, you bow and that's how you do your offering. So the incense is just a metaphor for your conduct and that's what you actually um, offer. Okay, what Bodhidharma speaks about next is called is flowers. Okay, uh, I'm not sure if I'm going a bit quick. Does anyone have any questions before we go to flowers? No, if you do, please uh, put it in the chat box. Okay, what is flowers? Why flowers? Because we offer flowers to the Buddha. And um, there's a story connected to this, which we shall come to once we finish reading this. Okay. It says flowers refers to speaking the Dharma, scattering flowers of virtue in order to benefit others and glorify the real self. The real, real self meaning uh, your potential for awakening, your and your uh, your Buddha nature. It says these flowers of virtue are those praised by the Buddha. They last forever and never fade. And whoever scatters such flowers reaps infinite blessings. If you think the Tathagata meant for people to harm plants by cutting off their flowers, you're wrong. Those who observe the precepts don't injure any of the myriad life forms of heaven and earth. Okay, what does this mean? Um, okay. This sentence that I'm highlighting is more of a Hmong thing, okay, for people who have left home because it has to do with our precepts. Monks and nuns, um, uh, in our precepts, we don't, uh, we don't harm any living things and that's, that extends to plants as well in, in, the, in the aspect of cutting um, flowers as offerings to the Buddha. And if someone were to say, but don't some monks and nuns plant vegetables? Um, and, and there are a lot of Chinese temples, uh, Mahayana temples. That are, yes, because they historically there's a reason for that. Um, historically, monks and nuns, uh, how you say, in India, there was a custom of uh, being able to go out for alms rounds. So monks and nuns, in our precepts, we don't cook either. But when Buddhism spread to China, and uh, there were many temples that were in places that were far away from people, the monks and nuns had to learn how to be self-sufficient. So they, there's a culture of monks and nuns doing farming, for example. Okay, so flowers. The story that I wanted to say is uh, Bodhidharma. Bodhidharma's first uh, disciple in China, which is, I think, well, the patriarch, um, the second, he was the second patriarch of China, Hui Ke. Uh, he's, uh, how you say, he has a very interesting story because he chopped off his arm to show his sincerity to Bodhidharma. Um, when he first met Bodhidharma, he was lecturing on the Lotus Sutra, Venerable Hoi Ke. And it is said that he lectured so well that flowers rained down from the heavens. So flowers and speaking the Dharma. And, but for all his uh, eloquence in speaking the Dharma, he did not recognize a true Petrarch. He did. He still did not recognize Bodhidharma. When he saw Bodhidharma, and uh, they had an exchange where Bodhidharma asked him what he was doing, and he said he was helping uh, living beings end birth and death. And Bodhidharma said, "But all you're doing is just pointing to the the words on on a page. Um, how is that going to help?" And he got so upset with Bodhidharma. Because Bodhidharma looked very different. Bodhidharma came from India. That he took his beads, which were apparently made from iron, 
so they were very heavy and he hit Bodhidharma um, across the face and apparently broke uh, one or two teeth of Bodhidharma so uh, I guess there's a caution here of um, maybe the lesson that I get from this story is that sometimes if someone gets too attached to the form of the practice um, you don't uh, there's still arrogance and uh, how you say you you think that uh, your skill in the practice like for example being able to sit really long or being able to lecture the sutras really well uh, you, you you neglect the 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 thoughts of greed and anger and arrogance uh, they are still there yeah and yeah okay let me look at the chat box um how about offering water? Uh, Bodhidharma doesn't say anything about offering water. <laughs> uh, is fifth incense like mindfulness? How is it different from wisdom? Let me go to the, what's the fifth incense? The incense of perfect knowledge, which means being always aware and nowhere obstructed. Okay. I think it's a result from mindfulness. And... Okay, Graciela says, uh, are there notes or commentary available to read later? I can share this in a WhatsApp group. I'm not sure if you are in a WhatsApp group, Graciela. Uh, or, and she says, oh, she can go through it again. Uh, oh, Tan is reminding Graciela, hey, you can go through it on YouTube. Yeah, you can. Yeah. All right. Uh, okay, the next one is about lighting lamps. Okay. If you go to our branch monastery in Malaysia called Tan Pian, it's um, it's right next to the Twin Towers, the famous Twin Towers in Kuala Lumpur. Okay, it's uh, when you enter, there is a place where you can light candles and oil lamps. Yeah. Okay. Let me copy the text over. And then there's a piece of paper on the on the inside of the of the monastery Tempian that says that if you light oil lamps, uh, you get a lot of benefits. So, uh, yeah, that brings me memories of that. So let's see what Bodhidharma has to say about lighting lamps. Okay, what he starts is he says, says long ago there was a Buddha named. Dipankara or lamp lighter. Dipankara can also be spelled as N. And who is Dipankara? Okay. I believe it's in the Lotus Sutra. Um, I'm not sure. Yeah, I better not say that. Okay, but there's a story about Shakyamuni Buddha before he became a Buddha. Okay, so Shakyamuni Buddha, this is one of his past lives. So what happened? Shakyamuni Buddha saw Dipankara Buddha uh, and he was so moved uh, by the Buddha's appearance and, and the countenance of the Buddha that when he saw that the Buddha was about to step over a, 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 I think a puddle of water or mud on the ground something um, he didn't want the Buddha's feet to get dirty so what he did was I think he was an ascetic at the time he had long hair so he spread his hair out on the ground so that the Buddha could use his hair as a mat so that his feet would stay clean. And at that moment, uh, Dipankara Buddha gave that person a prediction that one day he will become a Buddha and he gave his name. He said, one day you'll be known as Shakyamuni Buddha. Isn't that awesome? Yep. And there's another, um, uh, let me see if I can find my notes. There's also another encounter of that. If I can find my notes about Shakyamuni Buddha and Dipankara. Uh, uh, oh, yes, let me, I found it. Um, whenever anyone or a Buddha uh, introduces the Lotus Sutra in the countless mirrored worlds, it is said that Dipankara Buddha would appear. And I think this is found in, in the Lotus uh, Sutra. Yeah. Okay. Um, that was a much of a story. Sorry. Okay. So, Bodhidharma says, this was the meaning of his name. Okay. Dipankara, Lamb Lighter. 
then he goes into uh, scolding mode with probably the monks. Okay, he said, but fools don't understand the metaphors of the Tathagata. Persisting in delusions and clinging to the tangible, they light lamps of everyday vegetable oil and think that by illuminating the interiors of buildings or say giving light to the Buddha images, they are following the Buddha's teachings. How foolish. Okay, I'm going to highlight, scroll up. The light released by a Buddha from one curl between his brows can illuminate countless worlds. An oil lamp is no help. Or do you think otherwise? The eternal lamp represents perfect awareness. Likening the illumination of awareness to that of a lamp, those who seek liberation see their body as the lamp, their minds as his wick, the addition of discipline as his oil, and the power of wisdom as his flame. By lighting this lamp of perfect awareness, they dispel all darkness and delusion. And by passing this Dharma on to others, they are able to use one lamp to light thousands of lamps. And because these lamps likewise, uh, or, and, and, sorry, and because these lamps likewise light countless other lamps, their light lasts forever. So Bodhidharma is taking the external act of lighting a lamp which I used to do when I was young because we had an altar in my house. Uh, we had a floating wick. Uh, it's like a triangle thingy um, with the three feet, uh, three feet made of cork. So it will float on top of the uh, the oil. The oil will be poured on top of water. You have water at the bottom, oil on top, and then a floating wick thing with a wick in the middle that you light. And throughout the day, you would. Uh, uh, use a pair of uh, tweezers and you pull out the wick a bit so that the, the flame doesn't go out. Okay, I never knew then that uh, this is actually what uh, lighting lamps mean. There's an internal process to accompany the, the, the outer form of the practice. Okay, it's almost time. It's 5.45. Uh, what else does Bodhidharma say, which we'll come to the next few classes? Uh, he talks about second belly thing, he talks about uh, worshipping, yeah. Uh, so like I said, when I, I was really excited, I'm, I'm excited to share this with people because it has really, this text is one of those few texts that has really transformed my relationship with the Dharma. And it has helped a lot in, um, in me making sense of the external practices that we do, like the incense sprays, the bowings, the ceremonies, uh, all, all, all the practices you find in a, in a Mahayana um, temple. Yeah. Okay, let me see if there's any questions. Does the lamps here include offering candles to the sages? Um, I'm not too familiar with offering candles to the sages, but I guess anytime there is uh, light, you could, and these are not definite. Don't don't take Bodhidharma's uh, teachings to be. It only has to be like that. That that's the only way you can interpret the the teachings. Um, I I I think it's one way. Okay, it's it's definitely a very illuminating uh, way to understand practice. But it is not the only way. And for someone who has had the practice transform them, uh, they are able to explain the, the practices in different ways according to who they are dealing with so that they can um, help these people uh, overcome their own ignorance. All right. Um, can lay people speak Dharma to beings like unseen spirits, insects, animals, trees when we recite about sutras, mantras, and Buddha's name? Uh, if people speak dharma to beings like unseen spirits insects i think you know if you can see and if you know you, you already uh you don't need to know the answer to that question so be, until you get there you most probably learn and study the dharma for yourself yeah uh, okay well what is the text you're reference, referencing about bodhidharma okay i'm going to type it out on screen it's um or maybe I'll show you what the text looks like. Okay. 
Uh, is It's called the Zen Teaching of Bodhidharma, translated with an introduction by Ray Pine. You can find it on Amazon. Um, I'm, I can't give you the text because you have to purchase the, the text. It's not freely available. Uh, Ray Pine is, uh, what's his name? He used to live at CDTB. Um, uh, his name is, I just forgot his name. Ray Pine is like his penmanship name. Bill Porter. Yes, thank you, Tammy. Bill Porter. Yeah, he's a friend of, of CDTB. And Tam says, please share with me for word format. Uh, okay. So uh, thank you for joining us today. I am sorry for um, going above uh, the time. Okay. And it's time to dedicate merit. Has anyone thought about dedication of merit? Is it an afterthought that you do towards the end or true dedication of merit? Okay. Okay, I'm going to put my palms together. May every living being, our minds as one and radiant with light, share the fruits of peace with hearts of goodness, luminous and bright. If people hear and see how hands and hearts can find in giving unity, may their minds away to create compassion, wisdom, and to joy. May kindness find reward. May all who sorrow leave their grief and pain. May this boundless light dispel the darkness of their endless night. Because our hearts are one, this world of pain turns into paradise. May all become compassionate and wise. May all become compassionate and wise. Okay, everyone, we'll see you in two days' time. Okay, bye-bye.